Okay, you can move around the chairs any place you'd like. You can pull up a little bit if you can't see or want to Yeah, pull you closer. can come closer, you can go further away, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so here's, here's the challenge. I was thinking about this, and the question is, how to condense an eight-week course into 15 minutes? Yeah. Oh, so uh, what I'm going to do is tell you everything, everything you wanted to know about the commons in five words, OK? So ask questions later. And we'll have our grass cut by the end of the uh, session here. Yeah. Yeah. So, the first of these words is uh, ancient. The commons is ancient, meaning that the concepts of cooperation, how we share resources, how we work together, is not a new idea. It's one that you can see with, uh, if you go to Aboriginal people over 10,000 years ago, some of these structures that enabled uh, cooperation to be sustained over time with resources has been there. We've seen uh, in, uh, on the West, in 535, the Roman Emperor Justinian put together the Justinian Code that first, first described the commons, those resources that cannot be owned. Some can be, but some cannot, that are part of a commons. And then in, uh, in the United Kingdom, in 1215, there was the Magna Carta. In 1217, there was the Charter of the Forest that we see here. Charter of the Forest was in place for over 700 years in the UK, giving commoners the right to uh, resources to be able to use them. So this idea that the commons is not new, it's something that's been around, and it inherently conjoins with the way that human beings would naturally operate if they're not imposed upon by external structures. Second, idea, uh, second uh, word here is diverse. The first word is Patriot. Very good. <laughs> second word is diverse. <laughs> so we have different types of commons. Here, we're talking about natural resource commons. So what's the major commons we're talking about? Water. Water, Water right. And specifically, the Great Lakes. There are mountains, there are rivers, there are forests. There are all kinds of resources that need to be protected. The air we breathe. There are other kinds of commons as well. There are digital commons. All of us have used open source software. That's a commons of sorts. Uh, we have, in addition, we have all kinds of so social and cultural commons as well. Robert just spoke to us about language. Language is a commons. Even though some corporations are now trying to uh, copyright letters of the alphabet, believe it or not. <laughs> believe it or not. The, so there's a great breadth that we can consider commons. What are some other commons that might come to mind for you? Parks, highways. Parks, indeed, highways. 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 Chicago highways. just recently uh, privatized one of its commons with uh, parking spaces, yes. turning it over to a private company that's now going to make 10 times more than the city would have made. Uh, extraordinary. <coughs> Libraries can be a very vibrant commons altogether. Absolutely. Mathematics. Mathematics, for sure. Scientific knowledge is a very, very important commons. We traditionally thought universities would produce knowledge and, and that others could use that. And we're now seeing some very strange trends where the knowledge that's produced is sort of hoarded or uh, privatized. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Our connection to the water itself is a common. Exactly. The connection of the human heart to the natural earth around us is a part of a commons. The relationships that we have are indeed part of the commons. And so that brings us to the third word, which is a charity I already said it on uh, Sunday night. And that third word is commoning. The verb commoning. What's important here 
is that we're coming to understand that it's not just about the resource, but it's about the people who use the resource. Commenting is the people who use the resource have some participation in the rules that govern that resource. And so what we're saying in this conference together is that us as citizens of the Great Lakes, we have a, a right, you might say a sovereign right, we may be talking about this later, to actually participate in the governance of this resource. Very, very important idea. And whether that happens to be a community garden that you might have where people are gathered together to figure out who's going to plant the tomatoes where and the zucchinis where and how that's going to work out, or whether it's something like uh, Wikipedia, where are, there are rules that make it happen, the participants themselves have some say into those rules. So very, very important point. So our first word is, this is an advanced group, really. You couldn't do this with undergrads, I tell you. The second is, great. And the third is, very good. You're working for A's, I can tell you. The fourth, fourth word here is stewardship. We've heard much about this already. And we've gotten, I think, such a deep sense of this from Grandmother Josephine. This stewardship of the water, this natural kinship to the resource. <laughs> and what's important for us to understand here is how this contrasts with the current paradigm that we have of the market. So if, for instance, you look, what we're talking about with the commons is this sense of stewardship. But the market looks at ownership. The commons looks at a long-term perspective. The market is more short-term. In the commons, we look at intergenerational equity. So we're looking through time, looking at honoring the rights of the unborn. If you're in a corporation, you're looking at shareholder returns with an increasingly compressed time frame. Never more than a quarter, right? So decision making gets made in terms of that time frame, whether it's a quarter or looking out for seven generations. A sustainability orientation is something that is um, inherent, you might say, to a commons perspective, whereas a growth orientation is what we need from the market's point of view. And so we have a market system that relies on an assumption of unlimited growth. And that unlimited growth requires the endless, the endless extraction of resources. I was at a conference, actually it's a commons conference in India in 2011. The Minister of Forests came to speak at this, common, at this conference. And he was talking about how India, with all of its poverty, all of its challenges, needed to grow. They were currently growing at the time at 7% a year. They needed to ratchet that up to between 9 and 11% a year. If you have a country of over a billion people and you're trying to generate 11% economic growth year over year, you need to commodify everything in sight. So that kind of logic impels a certain kind of set of policies that are invariably destructive, invariably. And so the commons also enables this sense of collaboration Whereas inherent in capitalism is the notion of scarcity. And as a result of scarcity, there's competition. Scarcity for capital, scarcity for labor, scarcity for resources, scarcity for consumers. So a very, very different orientation. Which leads to the fifth word. The fifth word, very important when we talk about the commons. The fifth word is enclosure. The word originated when in Great Britain, 
when industrialization and even pre-industrialization, the barons, land barons, would actually enclose the land with hedges <coughs> or fences or walls so that the commoners could no longer uh, graze their uh, sheep or, or herd their uh, cows or collect uh, forest wood or whatever it might be. So this term enclosure has stuck within the commons literature as what happens when forces initiate actions that enable the commons to be restricted in one form or another. And I'll show you a very short, it's only a minute and a half, video clip of a kind of orientation that has been uh, so prevalent over the last 30 years that has spawned uh, a whole kind of generation of uh, enclosure. Even in the case of air, there's been some progress. And here the idea is to say, look, we can't avoid the dumping of carbon dioxide. We can't avoid the dumping of sulfur oxides. At least we can't at the moment afford to, to stop in that. So we're dumping a certain amount of, of stuff into the environment. So we're going to say, with the current tonnage of sulfur oxides, for example, we will say that is the limit, and we'll create permits for that amount, we'll give them to the people who've been doing the polluting, and now we will permit them to be traded. And so now, there's a price attached to polluting the environment. Now, wouldn't it be marvelous if we had one of those prices for everything? <laughs> it sounds like you're advocating private ownership of every square inch of the planet. Absolutely. Every cubic foot of air, water. It sounds outlandish to say we want to have the whole universe, the whole of the earth owned. That doesn't mean I want to have Joe Bloggs owning this square foot, but it means that the interests that are involved in that stream are owned by some group or by some people who have an interest in maintaining it. And that, you know, that is not such a loony idea. It's, it's in fact, the solution to a lot of these problems. So that perspective <laughs> that we're better off if market logic rules the world has enabled a situation we have today called financialization that there are trillions of dollars of derivatives traded on the basis of underlying assets that are, the derivatives are six times the value of the underlying assets. And as Maud was pointing out, there are people just salivating about the possibility that we could take all of Lake Michigan, all of Lake Superior, all of these lakes, and uh, commodify them. And then what will that do for investors? Uh, so we're in a point in time where it is so absolutely imperative that we inform our fellow citizens about what the consequences of this kind of orientation is. Because we may find that our very rights, the very essence of life becomes enclosed as well. I'll tell you just a brief story. Most of the time I teach executive MBAs. And so this is an older crowd. And we were talking about the commons. And one fellow is about 55. He's a dentist, very successful dentist, said, oh my god, you know, this thing around enclosures, I never quite understood it this way. He said, you know, I had a friend who got breast cancer, and uh, she was really distraught when she learned that she had breast cancer, a particular kind of breast cancer, and was very worried about what her prospects were. She went to the hospital, and um, the doctors told her there was a special kind of treatment that would be available to her uh, if she wanted. It was experimental. She decided to opt for this treatment. She had to sign some forms, some different kinds of waivers and stuff relative to this experimental treatment, and then receive the treatment. 
What she didn't know in the moment of duress that she had where she signed these forms is that she was assigning uh, the property rights of her breast cancer genes to a biotech company. Mm -hmm. This company then <laughs> claimed ownership on this particular kind of breast cancer and subsequently <coughs> prevented universities from doing research uh, in this area because it violated their intellectual property rights. It's just sort of madness, you know what I mean? And you see things that end up being, if you follow this logic out, it's a road, it's a road to nowhere still. So if I was going to end up with offering a sixth word, because our first word was Amen. Our second word was Amen. Third word was Amen. Wow. Fourth word was Amen. And the fifth word Amen. The sixth word I would offer is necessary. Necessary. Because look, if we rely just on the private sector, we know that cannot make it. The <laughs> logic of that cannot fulfill what human life needs altogether. If we rely just on the public sector, we know that what's happened today with governments is governments don't represent people, they represent interests. And those interests are special interests. And those special interests are related to, generally, the private sector. So the commons framework or a commons paradigm opens up and extends back through history and enables us to consider something very vibrant, very new, and very fresh. So you all get an A. Congratulations. <laughs>